It is October 2nd, 1997. Retired Air Force Captain Yorange Holanda is in his expensive home in Cabo Frio, Brazil. The former pilot and parachutist retired in 1992, but since then has struggled with illness. Captain Holanda had been suffering a chronic depressive disorder since the early 1990s. In my personal view, this depressive process originated from something that he had experienced a long time ago in the Amazon. Later that night, his daughter climbs the steps to her father's room. She finds a shocking scene. Her father is dead. He appears to have strangled himself. Was this a suicide brought on by mental illness or by something more sinister? Just two months earlier, the captain had given this exclusive interview to UFO researchers A.J. Javierd and Marco Petit. Both men study and document UFO incidents. This object went to Kalaras, then kept going as if it covered the Amazon in strips. There was an intelligence doing this. Four months into the operation, they ordered us to stop. Some UFO experts maintain that Captain Hollanda did not kill himself, but was murdered because he'd said too much about a series of frightening UFO encounters, some allegedly fatal, which took place in the Amazon jungle 20 years earlier. He gave eyewitness testimony based on his work as a military man who commanded one of the most serious operations in the world of UFOlogy. There is something very strange that the Air Force doesn't want revealed. I don't believe it was suicide. Holanda's death is connected to something beyond the normal. He left a very clear message that we are being visited. Captain Holanda's UFO sightings began here, on the island of Colores, at the mouth of the Amazon River in Brazil. Though it is only a two-hour drive from the bustling city of Belém, it is a world away in terms of culture and technology. They are poor people. They are fishermen and farmers, people who lead a very peaceful life. Like most people in Brazil, the 2,000 residents of Colores are predominantly Roman Catholic. But the island's remoteness has given rise to many local superstitions. They believe the island is mysterious, that a lot of phenomena occur there. The people of Colaris have their legends and their traditions. 78-year-old Emidio Campos Oliveira is a longtime resident of the island. Nearly 30 years ago, he was part of an extraordinary and disturbing series of events that transformed life on Colaris forever. I could feel it once the light went away. I felt the burning. It was here. The mark was kind of a circle. It was red in the middle of a black spot. It began on a warm night in October 1977. Around 11 p.m., Oliviera is ready for bed. His wife kisses him goodnight as he settles into a hammock in the living room where he likes to sleep. Suddenly, 
a beam of light floods the room. It appears to be coming from above. It is so powerful that it penetrates the ceramic tiles of his roof. A bright light appeared before my eyes, coming down from the ceiling on top of me. It attacked my thigh. I felt a burning sensation. The light was quite bright. Quite bright. As quickly as it came, the light disappears. Unable to find an explanation for what has just happened, he tries to go back to sleep. Days later, at about 8 p.m., 24-year-old Orivaldo Malakia Spinheiro, a local fisherman, sets out with a friend for some night fishing. I was on the beach, and we were throwing out the net, but the net wasn't catching anything. So we pulled it back in and left to see if we could find another position to see where we could catch some fish. The two fishermen wait patiently for their catch. Suddenly, Penhiro's friend notices a low-flying, bright light in the sky. There was no noise, no smell. He looked out to the sea, and this light was coming from the direction of the sea toward us. We got scared and took off running. The two men race towards town. Panic-stricken, they tell other residents about what they've just seen. They learn that they are not the only ones to experience these mysterious sightings. In fact, dozens of people say that over the past few weeks, they've been chased as if they're being hunted down and attacked by the lights. 25-year-old dentist Lucia Helena Marquez says she too had a strange encounter on a nearby beach. We were at the market and there was a commotion. This object appeared and everyone ran to the seashore. We saw two lights hovering in the air. One light would be on and the other would be off. They kept doing it like a signal. The colors that we saw most were red. Red was the brightest color, then green, red, green, and yellow in the back. Then it just disappeared. As residents of Colaris struggle to make sense of these strange occurrences, two hours away in Belém, 25-year-old reporter Carlos Mendez gets a call in his office. I first heard pieces of information through telephone calls from people linked to the town. They were saying the newspaper should go there because these lights were appearing and the people were becoming very afraid. Mendez, who works for the newspaper O Estado do Para, calls his photographer. The two men leave for Colores that night. When they arrive, the men are swarmed by residents, wanting to tell their stories about being attacked by strange beams of light. Some even say they have been wounded by the lights. One woman, she was in her house at night, when suddenly she saw the brightness. And she noticed that the light was shining on her house. It pierced the roof and lit up the bedroom. The woman says her legs and arms were paralyzed. And the next day, she noticed something strange on her chest. On her breast, there were marks, as if someone had perforated her breast a number of times in the same place with a pin. Other alleged victims tell similar stories. They also say that while they were immobilized by the light, they felt as if it were somehow sucking their blood. Reporter Carlos Mendez never sees the lights for himself. 
He doesn't know what to make of the bizarre stories, but he can see that the terror is real. I noticed a lot of fear in those humble people. It was a sign that something very bad was happening. Over the next two months, the sightings increase and the island erupts in panic. Over 80 people report being targeted by intense beams of light. The stories were always the same. The lights came down from space, sucked on those people, paralyzed these people, and affected these people. They couldn't understand why they were being attacked, but they said they were attacked violently. So I was trying to understand why it was happening and if the lights were really appearing to these people. The locals become so alarmed that many of the women and children leave town. Some men light bonfires along the beach and stand guard at night. Others stay locked in their homes for fear of being targeted. I saw the people's fear. I saw the feeling of terror these people had. And I saw the plea for help that the people were making. It seems as if someone or something is attacking the people of Calaris. No one knows why. September 1977. Panic has overtaken the remote Brazilian island of Colares, 68 miles north of Belém. Dozens of residents say they've been attacked by strange beams of light emitted by unidentified objects in the sky. At that time, Dr. Valaiti Carvalho is the 24-year-old director of the local health care unit. She has been on the island for only six months. Over the last few days, the young doctor has seen an increase in her patient load, many of whom claim they have been injured by these unexplained lights. People kept showing up, and I was getting irritated because I thought it was getting to be too much. It was mass hallucination. It was mass delirium. I had more and more cases. I remained skeptical, thinking they had all gone crazy for some reason. The symptoms the doctor sees are all the same. The patients display what appear to be radiation burns, as well as unusual puncture marks. Physician Daniel Rabiso studied the events on Colores. The marks were generally at the thorax level, shoulders, chest, cases on the thigh, the leg, and generally the burn was small. It wasn't very extensive, a maximum of 15 centimeters in diameter. Dr. Velaide observed small papillas as if there were two small injections in the location of the wound. Victims report that these burns were caused when the light made contact with their skin. But the wounds are unlike any burns the young doctor has treated before. As marcas causadas pelas queimaduras. The marks caused by the burns turned black suddenly, as if they were burns that had been around for 10 days or so. However, many times it had only been 10 minutes since they were made. And the doctor's most disturbing cases are yet to come. In September, she examines a woman whom relatives claim has been attacked inside her home by a bright light. She arrived being carried by family members. She was already in a state of spasms as if she was having cardiac arrest. Her mouth was shut tight, her eyes were closed, she had no reflexes at all. Carvalho tries to stabilize the woman's condition, but there's no sign of improvement. 
eu e da minha equipe, nós não tivemos. There was nothing more we could do. A única coisa que nos restou. The only thing left was to put her in a car, since we didn't have an ambulance, and drive her to Belém. E viarmos para Belém. Carvalho waits for an update on the woman's condition. Five days later, another serious case is brought to her clinic. A woman, whom witnesses say was hit by a strong beam of light while standing in her yard. She arrived in a squad car in such a profound state of rigidity that they couldn't fold her into the car. And she came lying on the back seat with her legs sticking out because they couldn't bend them in. Carvalho sends this patient to the city as well. Soon, the doctor receives word from the regional hospital in Belém about her patients. They are both dead. Foi feito por mim dentro da própria. I had requested that the cause of death be determined because it was of interest to the population. Para que a população soubesse qual a causa da morte. And the cause of death was listed as unknown. Carvalho still does not believe that beams of light attacked her patients, but she suspects that the growing hysteria over the sightings may have led to a heart attack or stroke. Hoping to put an end to the panic, Carvalho and other town officials begged the mayor for help. In September, the mayor contacts the Regional Air Command of the Brazilian Air Force, or COMAR. It is at this point that Comar assigns Captain Yorange Holanda to lead a team of Air Force officers in an investigation of the strange events on the island. According to reporter Carlos Mendez, who is researching the events on Colares, Holanda's team may have been dispatched because the area has been the site of repeated guerrilla attacks by communist rebels. The reporter believes the Air Force assumes the lights are being created by weapons fire in the jungle, and Holanda's job is to track down the rebels. I believe that the objective of the military in Kolaris was, first of all, to investigate if there was any subversive activity from communist agents. But if that's the case, the project is given a curious name. Captain Holanda's mission is known as Operation Saucer. He assembles his team quickly. 37-year-old civilian Pinon Frias is brought on as a pilot. There was suspicion that it was a type of device that was violating Brazilian airspace. We didn't know what country it was from, but something was violating airspace. The Air Force has the obligation to verify what it's about. At the beginning of September, Holanda's team of officers, engineers, and scientists arrives on Colares. The men erect shelters and set up telescopes and cameras on nearby beaches. Their activities are carried out in full view of the island's residents, in the hope of calming the fear that has gripped the island. When we arrived in Colares, there was total panic in the town. The population wasn't sleeping because of the fear. Despite attempts to calm them down, we couldn't do it, especially the older residents, some of whom had been affected by the lights. Once on the island, the Operation Saucer team tries to gather as much information as possible. Captain Holanda immediately goes to see Dr. Carvalho. The first thing proposed to me at 6 o'clock in the morning when I received the Air Force entourage was that I tell the community from that point on that all these cases of affected people were mass hysteria. For the doctor, the meeting is an early sign that the Air Force is not interested in seeking the truth, but in covering it up instead. Carvalho refuses to go along with their plan. I couldn't trick a community that expected so much from me, especially support and credibility. Holanda also meets with local eyewitnesses. 
including then 48-year-old Emilio Campos Oliveira, a resident who says he's been burned on his thigh by the light. They came to see me. They photographed where I was hit. The only ones who saw my mark were people from the Air Force. They saw the mark. The sightings continue throughout the next four months. Captain Holanda's team is busy collecting information from witnesses and town officials. Their surveillance equipment is in use 24 hours a day. But the Air Force does not release their findings to the public. Those who think that Operation Saucer will help determine the truth are disappointed. Instead, some believe a cover-up has already begun. By October 1977, the strange occurrences on the island of Calaris have caused the Brazilian Air Force to investigate. Residents claim that UFOs have attacked them with powerful beams of light. Some people develop strange burn marks on their skin after the encounters. Two women have even died. The Air Force's project Operation Saucer, under the leadership of Captain Yurange Holanda, is gathering information on the mysterious sightings. The military did not take weapons to Kolaris. Their weapons were cameras. Lots of cameras. Over a four-month period, Holanda and his team take photos and make sketches. These are their actual drawings. They also conduct interviews with the residents, including Dr. Valide Carvalho. She has treated dozens of patients who claim they have been attacked. Initially, the doctor is skeptical about their stories, but soon she experiences a UFO sighting herself. It is around six o'clock. Carvalho is returning home from her shift at the local health care unit and sees a woman faint. I looked up, and that which I had denied, that I didn't believe in, that I thought was the product of delirium, craziness, made-up stories, people wanting attention, I saw the object at the height of approximately a 10-story building. The object is cylindrical. Carvalho suddenly feels paralyzed by what she is seeing. It didn't have the color of stainless steel, or the color of silver, or the color of anything else. It had its own color, and it moved in elliptical movements. It was directly over my head, making elliptical movements and coming back again. According to statements from witnesses, at this exact time, the Air Force picks up a signal on the radar his men have set up on a nearby beach. As the team scrambles to focus their telescopes and cameras, the object disappears. It turned toward the bay and headed out to sea. Holanda and his team continue their surveillance on Colores. They collect over 500 photographs and 15 hours of film showing what appear to them to be bright lights high in the sky. The reports from the investigation are sent back to Comar headquarters in the nation's capital of Brasilia. The Air Force really delved into the investigation. They had to give some kind of an answer to the people that were having these encounters. And I'm certain that it came as a surprise that the military men from the Air Force themselves began having their own encounters, their own experiences. 
In December 1977, ufologists A.J. Javierd and Marco Petit are hard at work writing for the Brazilian publication UFO Magazine when they hear about the stories from Colares. The military operation is the first military operation that we know of in Brazil and probably in the world entirely dedicated to, to try to understand what was going on here involving the UFO phenomena. Over 3,000 people were interviewed by this military in a four-month period. That same month, Captain Holanda is ordered to surrender all materials and return to Komar. The photographs, films and sketches they collected are kept classified. He was given the order to shut down the Operation Saucer immediately. He was a military, he didn't ask much question. One of the things that most shocked me and the other colleagues was the fact that at the end of December in that year of 1977, when the encounters were becoming increasingly fruitful, the order came, and to this day no civilians know who it came from, saying that the operation was terminated. Over the next few months, reports of strange sightings and bizarre attacks subside. In time, the stories about mysterious lights in the sky drift into local legend. For the next 30 years, Operation Saucer is kept under wraps, but Captain Holanda does not remain silent forever. In 1997, he decides to meet with A.J. Javierd and Marco Petit in a videotape meeting just outside Rio de Janeiro. In this rarely seen video, the captain gives his chilling account of what happened on the island. The ship gave an explosion like thunder. A very strong explosion and brightness. It took off at incredible speed toward the atmosphere. and disappeared among the stars. In 1977, the Brazilian Air Force's UFO investigation, called Operation Saucer, generates a massive report which sits in classified government archives for over 20 years. The files contain roughly 500 photographs and 3,000 interviews with witnesses who claim that they were attacked by bright lights in the sky over the Amazonian island of Colares. It is not until 1997 that the veil of secrecy begins to lift. June 1997. UFOlogist and editor of the Brazilian publication UFO Magazine, A.J. Javierd, is at work when he receives a phone call. On the other end of the line is Captain Yurange Holanda. Holanda was in charge of the Air Force team sent to Colaris back in 1977. And he called me and said, I always admire what you've done. I, I think you've done the right thing. And in the past, we, we weren't able to talk because, you know, I was in the military. But right now, I'm retired. And if you want to talk to me, please come to my place. Soon, Javierd and his co-editor, Marco Petit, head to see Holanda. For two days, the three men gather at the captain's house in Cabo Frio, just outside Rio de Janeiro. They videotaped the entire meeting. It was a man with a very uh, lucid uh, memory, very, very good memory, who could report in details things that happened 20 some years before with such a precision that impressed us. The most important part 
without a doubt, is his description of the encounters he had with these ships. He came face to face with ships that sometimes were 100 meters in diameter, of varied shapes, and that really placed him in a situation that few people, in global terms, had the opportunity to witness. We could hear a sound like an air conditioner, that kind of dull sound. And deep inside the sound, there was a clicking noise, like the sound of a ratchet. This noise coming from the ship was very clear. Hollanda describes in detail three different encounters with alien spaceships. These are the drawings he made to depict his first encounter. He told the researchers that his second encounter occurred one evening while he and his team were standing on the beach. The light came close to us and stopped high. It was high, quite high up there. But it stopped and actually made a circle around us. It made a circle and then took off toward the east. The captain then describes his last and most shocking encounter. He tells the ufologists that he was visited by a humanoid from one of the ships while he was in bed. I was lying on my side. Suddenly, a very powerful flash lit up the room. I was startled. I heard a strange thing, and immediately afterward, there was a being behind me, hugging me. It was a rather strange situation. The captain then goes on to describe the alien. It was a meter and a half tall, more or less, dressed in a suit resembling an astronaut or a diving suit. It was kind of soft. It wasn't very tight. I didn't see the face. It had a mask that was lead gray, and I couldn't tell the details of the face. I didn't see any eyes. I didn't see any shape. Holanda also tells the researchers that the alien spoke to him. I was very frightened. And that thing behind me, hugging me, squeezing me, and it spoke into my ear in Portuguese with a sound. It seems like a computer, that metallic voice. It spoke into my ear. Take it easy. We're not going to do you any harm. Holanda says that the alien then disappeared. He could tell us with such a precision what happened. And you can see that there was a, a great variety of objects operating in this area. Some objects, strangely, they would come from the jungle. They would come from the, between the trees. Some other would come from the sky. And a few others would come from the water. That's very amazing. The captain makes another startling claim. He shows the ufologists his arm. There appears to be an object implanted under the skin. He says that the alien put it there during his last encounter. Flexible, plastic. Here, you press and it shows up there. This point here. Did you ever get it x-rayed? Yes, but it didn't show anything. In July 1997, Holanda's story is published in Javert and Petit's UFO magazine. But those hoping that his startling disclosure will lead to a second investigation are disappointed. Instead, a new chapter of the Kolaris mystery begins. On October 2nd, 1997, Captain Holanda dies. The official cause of death is asphyxia, but it is not clear if the death was accidental, suicide, or perhaps murder. According to colleagues, Holanda did have a history of mental illness and had attempted to kill himself before. 
Yet others who knew the captain say it could not have been suicide. His co-pilot, Pinon Frias, suspects that he may have been murdered. Holanda would never take his own life. I can't accuse anyone of anything either. But he would never tie a rope around his own neck and lie down hanging himself. But A.J. Jevierd disagrees with Frias. He took his own life. That was his decision. He was depressed. But what I know is that that man left us a very important message is that we are being visited. And the Brazilian Air Force, which means the Brazilian government, knows about it. In March 2004, A.J. Jevierd and Marco Petit decide to take action. Six years after the captain's death, they demand access to the classified Colaris report under a campaign they created called Freedom of UFO Information Now. This kind of information that we are talking about I believe, as a UFO researcher and as a citizen of Brazil, that it should not be restricted to the military files, to the military headquarters. It must be known by all society. In the Air Force archive, Jevierd and Petit will find these sketches and photos made by Holanda and his team, records that have been hidden for over 30 years. On May 20th, 2005, Brazilian ufologists A.J. Jevierd and Marco Petit and a handful of other UFO researchers arrive at Brazilian Air Force headquarters to examine classified documents they have pressured the government to reveal. These files contain information about the 1977 military investigation called Operation Saucer. Jevierd and Petit believe the records contain data about UFO activity on the island of Colares. The brigadier, he said, I was being given an order from the commander of the Brazilian Air Force to open to you all files. You can watch everything that you please. But in fact, the two claim they are not permitted to see all the documents about the incidents. These are some of the photos they examined. Out of more than 2,000 pages of text, 500 photographs, and over 15 hours of film, they are only permitted to view 110 photos and 200 documents. The materials are both illuminating and puzzling. They reveal that the Brazilian government devoted a great deal of time investigating the sightings. They document numerous statements given by eyewitnesses. The files contain more details than the ufologists had ever imagined. Jevierd and Petit are not permitted to view the films contained in the files, but they do uncover photographs taken by Captain Holanda, the head of Operation Saucer. The grainy black and white photos show bright lights high in the night sky. In ufology, a picture is not worth a thousand words. You have to analyze the report of the people who took the picture. Captain Holanda's voluminous report contains sketches and descriptions of his alleged encounters with alien aircraft. We had access to several documents that described the encounters in detail, including reconstructions in the form of drawings, not only of the cases that involved the military, but also the cases that involved the residents. The documents describe several different encounters with the mysterious lights. The UFOs could come closer to people, and sometimes they could uh, go uh, sm uh, get sm small, shrink it or enlarge it, get lighter, like uh, more illuminated. The report concludes by describing the burn and puncture marks supposedly caused by the lights. 
but offers no proof that they are connected. The report leaves this and many other questions unanswered. It does not attempt to determine the source of the lights or try to debunk the speculation that they came from alien aircraft. Today it seems clear that a definitive explanation for the Colaris sightings will not come from the Brazilian government. Officially, the Air Force states that, regarding Operation Saucer, a report was produced with diverse depositions, apparently without any scientific foundation. For the time being, new information may come from the work of independent researchers and ufologists. Physician Daniel Rabiso has studied the Colaris sighting since 1985. He began his research by trying to discover other possible causes for the burn marks found on victims. There was a suspicion that it could have been an animal, maybe a bat. This theory was discarded because when vampire bats bite, they leave marks in the shape of an O. It is a bite and it bleeds a lot. There was no bleeding in this case. Rabiso also considered the theory that the sightings on Colaris could be attributed to mass hallucination. It was thought that it could have been mass panic, self-mutilation, that people were scratching themselves, hurting themselves. This also wasn't what happened. Rabiso's research suggested that the wounds were not self-inflicted. What it seems is that there was very intense radiation that paralyzed the nervous system and the light must have extracted something. Rubiso also looked into possible sources for lights that were seen on the island. At the time of the sightings, the Brazilian government was fighting communist guerrillas in the state of Para, in which Colares is located. There was a suspicion that it might be a weapon, some clandestine maneuvers of guerrillas using devices to frighten off the population in order to bring in weapons, munitions, and war supplies to Para. Despite reports of guerrilla activity, the government will neither confirm nor deny the information. Reporter Carlos Mendez, who covered the events on Colares, has no explanation for the strange lights the islanders described. But he believes that the remoteness of Colares and the superstitions of its inhabitants may have played a role in keeping the stories about UFO sightings alive. The people were shocked, frightened. The people of Colares have always lived with legends, with folklore from the countryside. This is typical of the Amazon. Today, the mystery remains. What was flying in the skies above Colaris? And why did people think they had been attacked by beams of light? I believe that they were extracting biological material, probably blood, so that they could create vaccines and develop some protection for their own bodies, for their own civilization. So that when the day arrived of final contact with mankind, they would no longer be susceptible to the illnesses and diseases that we humans present.